Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this Red Gaming Tech Adulcom video, we're going to be discussing as well as analysing tech news, which as usual has popped up in the past 24 or so hours. Video you like, you're having an amazing day. We have, of course, lots of news to get through in this video, and I'll start things out with AMD's Arcturus. As a quick refresher, Arcturus is not a... GPU in the traditional sense. This is a GPU which is designed for high performance computing, AI acceleration, and so on and so on. And AMD are currently putting the finishing touches onto Arcturus. I recently covered this more extensively in a video, which I'll try to remember to link in the video description. However, there's a small update thanks to Rogame. He's been digging through firmware and driver revisions and has discovered that Arcturus actually has a couple of different derivatives, including a version which is 64 compute units. So Arcturus does go up to 128 compute units for the highest end SKU, but apparently the lowest end, uh, sorry, lower end, we will see up to uh, 64 compute units. Komachi on Twitter also shed more light onto Arcturus uh, back in uh, a couple of weeks ago, actually. February 7th, he put out a tweet where he was digging through a BIOS that he'd managed to obtain, and the GPU contains high bandwidth memory too, and has a power envelope of 200 watts for the early samples, and uh, has 32 gigabytes of HBM. Although, once again, this is an early sample, so most likely TDP will be higher for final production boards, apparently, according to him, and we'll also see higher clock frequencies because the base frequency here is just uh, 1090 megahertz, with 1333 being the boost clock. I'm also going to quickly touch on a leak for the 10900, although... I won't spend super long analysing this because, honestly, the uh, chip here is a very early engineering sample, or at least a sample which is not indicative of what you would purchase with a 10900K. Basically, the clock speed is running at just around 2.5 gigahertz, and when we're talking about boosting, it just hits 3200 megahertz for all 10 cores, and for single core workloads, it's just 4.4 gigahertz. Of course, officially, Intel haven't confirmed the clock frequencies for the 10900K, but it's looking like around 3.7 gigahertz is the base uh, clock, and the single core boost could be 5.1 or 5.3, depending whether you're referring to velocity boost or just plain old regular boost, and all core boosts could be either 4800 megahertz or it could go up to 4900 megahertz. Either way, the website X Fastest recently actually release a couple of images for the 10th generation Intel processors, and as a reminder, it's using the LGA1200 socket, which is very similar aesthetically to the uh, current generation chips. The only difference is that they will have more pins, uh, but you can basically use a current generation cooler on one of these chips. But as for the score, well, Cinebench R20 we are looking at just 3,714 points for the multi-thread and 441 for the single thread. Uh, so this is kind of slow, but another benchmark which was shown is CPU-Z, where it scored 508 points. I'm slightly rounding up there, and multi-thread is 5343. Uh, temperatures are pretty decent, but it is, once again, an uh, engineering sample, so you can't really take much uh, out of the temperatures. My personal take on this, I wouldn't really say that this is good or bad for a result. I really want to know what the Ks are capable of, particularly when it comes to overclocking, and I'd also really like to see what Intel price it. I know I keep saying this in virtually every video, but the make or break for the 10th generation isn't necessarily performance, it's going to be the pricing. Um, I really want to see them price it ideally with slightly cheaper than the 9900K is now, that is for the flagship part. Um, we've seen some recent leaks that, well that may not be the case. Intel may actually have a slight premium over the tenth gener oh, sorry, over the ninth generation parts, which I don't think is going to fly. I find it very difficult to recommend a tenth generation CPU 
uh, over the Ryzen 3000 series, if that's the case, because you're going to be, especially if the 10, uh, the 10900K is more expensive than the 9900K, at that point you're getting, well, just... It just doesn't make sense to go with anything other than a 3900X or a 3950X. However, if Intel can do a decent price on the chip, then for gamers or content creators who don't necessarily need a ton of threads, but just need really fast threads, then maybe the 10900K would make more of a, a sensible purchase. Right now, I would say that uh, AMD probably is going to be a better deal, but we can only wait and see. And cross our fingers that Intel do price uh, aggressively. From AMD to Intel, let's throw in NVIDIA, shall we? Seems like we might as well. Uh, there's a fascinating set of claims by a Twitter user, Kitty Corgi. Now, I will go in with this with a massive truckload of salt, because this individual, unlike, say, someone like Kamachi, has had an incredibly good track record, uh, finding and discovering leaks that which have put, uh, found out that uh, turned out, excuse me, to be true, or say Tim Apisak on Twitter, who is incredibly good at digging through uh, benchmark databases, and that information turns out to be true. K Kitty Corgi has very few tweets on their Twitter account, and the tweets that they have posted have not actually been proven to be correct or incorrect. But with that said, uh, I might as well throw them in. However, I would heavily stress that this information is probably not right. Um, that's not to say that they're lying, it's just to say that we have no way to know. Um, I'm tackling this mostly because a couple of people have already emailed me about it, to be honest. Uh, but anyway, apparently Ampere, the GA100 flagship, is going to have a die which is 800 excuse me, and 26mm squared. That, I can't even describe any other way that is just humongous. This same user has also created a couple of block diagrams, although much the same could be said with the block diagrams compared with the uh, claims regarding the size of the GPU. You can see that there are some noticeable differences with Ampere. Allegedly, most of this is going to come down to the tensor core stuff. Um, we can see that the tensor cores are basically doubled up. They've been drastically re-engineered to quite clearly help with stuff like DLSS. Allegedly, the improvements we will see are Interjet 32 unit is identical to what we currently have now. The FP32 unit has been doubled. The performance of the tensor cores has been doubled. I just mentioned that. There's enhancements for the level 1 data cache, and the new architecture for gaming is going to have a drastic redesign of the ray tracing cores. We can assume that this is basically going to just do more work. Um, how it's going to do that, maybe it's just more efficient, maybe they run faster, maybe there's something entirely different going on that we just don't know about. But the highest end SKU, for gaming anyway, that we can see here, is going to be the GA103. It's going to have 60 SMs with a 320-bit uh, memory interface. This means you can have either 10 or 20 gigabytes of RAM. Obviously, that's going to depend on how large the DRAM modules are. As a quick reminder, each memory module is 32-bit. So if you have 10 of them, then obviously that's a 320-bit bus. That's pretty simplistic stuff. But anyway... This GPU would be quite monstrous, and there's been no evidence that this is true or false, you know, officially especially. But one thing I can say is that one consistent rumour for the next generation cards is that they will have drastically improved ray tracing performance. And realistically, there's a couple of ways that NVIDIA can do that. The first is to be able to calculate rays more effectively and faster, but also technology like DLSS uh, is obviously going to be of critical importance. And also the tensor cores have other uses as well, uh, particularly when it comes to like denoising images. So whether this is true, who the hell knows? Switching to the specifications, the RTX 3080 GA103 is apparently 60 SMs and 320-bit memory interface. That's 10 gigabytes or 20 gigabytes of RAM. Uh, that, of course, will be the RTX 3080 Ti. 
basically speaking, this is going to be monstrous. It's going to be absolutely ridiculous. Uh, assuming this is genuine, and I would take this with, well, maybe about 20,000 truckloads of salt. The only thing that I will say that makes me think that this is potentially accurate is that it's not out of the realms of potentials that I could see NVIDIA pursuing. Basically, this is going to drastically improve ray tracing performance because, well, ray tracing is going to be doubled up here, pretty much. And we also have a massive increase in DLSS performance thanks to the um, tensor cores. Uh, tensor cores aren't just for DLSS, though. There are other things like uh, denoising the image. Um, so we could be seeing a drastic increase in performance over Turing, which is one of the things that's consistently been said for the next generation cards, that we could be seeing a massive increase in ray tracing performance up to 50%. It's been a pretty consistent rumor, which would tally up what we're seeing here. And uh, on the same vein, we've got the 3080, which is using the GA104, which is obviously a smaller piece of silicon. It has just... 48 SMs and could contain over 8 or 16 gigabytes of memories. Uh, much the same could be said here. It would make sense in terms of what you would expect for a next generation card. The problem is that we just don't know if any of this is true or it's just a guess from this individual. So I would probably say it's more of a wish list for what we could expect from NVIDIA, but don't be surprised if it turns out to be kind of accurate. And I'd also like to quickly touch on an update for Sony, and this also pertains to Oculus as well. You might recall that Sony have recently backed out of PAX East because of concerns over the <coughs> word I can't say because YouTube will demonetize me for whatever silly reason. <coughs> you know what I'm talking about. Cough, cough, that thing. Uh, but basically, Sony have provided an update and have also stated that they will not be attending the Game Developer Conference, which of course takes place in March. Furthermore, Facebook's VR headset brand, Oculus, are also not going to be attending the show either. Sony issued the following statement to GamesIndustry.biz. We have made the difficult decision to cancel our participation in the Games Developer Conference due to increasing concerns related to cough, cough. We felt this was the best option as the situation uh, and restrictions are changing daily. We are disappointed to cancel our participation, but the health and safety of our workforce is the highest concern, and we look forward to participating in GDC in the future. Oculus also issued a very similar statement. The only difference here is they said that we are still planning to share exciting announcements uh, through videos, online Q&As and more, and we will host a GDC partner meetings remotely in the coming weeks. Sony, on the other hand, haven't actually provided any details of what they're going to do to replace their GDC participation. And now, in the final piece of news for the day, I'd like to discuss with you GeForce Now, because developers seem to be pulling away from the service, despite the fact that it is incredibly popular. GeForce Now, since it's left beta, has been very well received. It does have a few problems, but overall, in terms of visual quality and given the price of it, plus as well the model I think is actually phenomenal, you basically buy the games off your own merits and then you can pretty much log into your account um, and then play the games remotely. It's awesome in that you are not tying the games to NVIDIA's service. So if NVIDIA decides to pull the plug on GeForce now, the games are still tied to your Steam account or what have you, which I much prefer the idea of compared to, let's say, one of their infamous competitors. Anywho, while the service itself has been well received from gamers, as I mentioned, around a million people now have signed up since the uh, official launch of it and it's pulled out of beta, the problem is developers and publishers aren't so much with the happies. Indeed, Bethesda have just pulled almost all of their games from GeForce Now. 
Uh, the company have announced that, well, there's only going to be one title remaining, which is Wolfenstein Young Blood, which is actually RTX enabled. So maybe that's the reason that it actually remained. I'm guessing here, this is not, of course, an official statement, but maybe NVIDIA paid some money for RTX features like uh, ray tracing to be enabled with Wolfenstein. So the first of all, like, well, we can't really remove that. According to uh, the vice president of GeForce Now in a blog post, developers and publishers maintain control over their content and decide which games you purchase are able to be streamed on GeForce Now and game removals should be few and far between. New games will be added to GeForce Now every week. Furthermore, NVIDIA have actually conf uh, confirmed that Cyberpunk 2077 will be available to stream the moment that the game officially launches, albeit you're going to need to purchase the game via Steam. So, I mean, honestly, I can see people who have lower-end devices who want to experience Cyberpunk with all of its shiny goodness uh, would probably be benefiting quite heavily with uh, picking up a subscription to GeForce now. I've not actually tried it myself yet. It's one of those things I keep meaning to try and I just keep forgetting to. Uh, but we've also seen other developers pretty much do similar. Uh, Electronic Arts have made most of their titles unplayable. Rockstar, Square Enix, even Capcom aren't fully embracing it. A couple of developers have kind of hinted that just licensing stuff and uh, we are super sorry we're going to resolve this. But it's kind of hard to take this in any other way other than them getting kind of nervous that NVIDIA are going to be just basically controlling the market here. Uh, because they've basically done it right, in my opinion. Um, NVIDIA are not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. But here I think they got the model just perfect. I think their model is really good. I think it's about the best. I think the pricing's really good. Um... I would like for them to support higher resolutions and stuff, but overall I think that their model is about the best you can expect. The only thing that I would prefer even more than this is like a Netflix type of solution, but in which case you've got uh, Microsoft. I think Microsoft and NVIDIA are going to really uh, be kind of the leaders in streaming in this way. That is, of course, if NVIDIA doesn't continue to lose games. It's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. Anyway, I think that's just about it for this particular video. Hopefully, you have enjoyed it. If you did, then of course you know what to do. Like, share, comment, and subscribe. Tomorrow will be a analysis video. I will be putting up something concerning both next-generation consoles. And also, if you have not uh, checked out the interview with AdShare... Uh, I'd encourage you to check it out, which is a software ray tracing solution. So, of course, that was the video that I plonked up yesterday. I'll try to remember to link it in the video description, but you can just search AdShare on the um, on the YouTube channel or, you know, find it another way. It's really fascinating. The CEO of the company actually hints that we could be seeing older consoles, hint current generation, run ray tracing with his solution, which is really interesting. Plus as well, he goes into a lot more stuff for ray tracing and just overall visual coolness. But with that said, hopefully you've enjoyed the video and I'll see you soon. Bye for now.